What's up, Brent here from Learn Jazz Standards, where we help musicians just like you learn how to play jazz, all while shortening the learning curve no matter what instrument you play. Welcome to episode 300 of the podcast. Big day for us. I've got two incredibly special guests on the show today. Two members of my team, really important members of my team. We've got Justin Keller and we've got Brett Pontecorvo. And we also have some amazing guests here. Members of our Inner Circle membership joining us live. We are recording this live today. So, so excited to have everybody here. This is a big monumental moment in the history of the podcast. So, to start it off, I'd like to introduce my two team members. Uh, Justin, why don't we start with you? Let everybody know what you do for Learn Jazz Standards and, uh, yeah, who you are. Yeah. My name is Justin Keller. I get to uh, do all of the fun back end stuff on the website. So, I am answering some of your support questions. Several of you have, um, we've uh, chatted in uh, through email. Uh, so when uh, something has gone wrong, I am the person that gets to uh, um, make sure that download works for you or uh, your subscription continues on without a hitch. So uh, I'm really excited to, to be here on the podcast. The way I think of you, Justin, is like you're like the guy where when things go horribly wrong and you're there to fix the problem, like something with the website and we're going to go, God forbid the, the site goes down. Right. And we're going to go into some of that a little bit later on in the show. There's all sorts of really interesting things that you're going to find out about learn jazz standards today that you probably had no idea were happening. Cause today's episode is really a deep dive into how the sausage is made basically and some history of learn jazz standards. Uh, Brett, let's go to you. What do you do for learn jazz standards? Yeah. Um, what do I do? So I guess primarily, well, yeah. How do I even answer it? I do a couple different things. I make all the sheet music. So anything that's printed, um, any PDFs or whatever I, I make. And then I do some videos. Like if you're doing your monthly uh, Learn Jazz Standards Club, I'm recording those videos. Um, yeah. And then I'm in the forums all the time. I guess that's the other thing I do. I get to kind of connect with people in the forums and help people, you know, get better at playing jazz. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, Brett, I think of you as you're the guy that is really keeping our inner circle membership running like a smooth like machine. And I think it's going to be really interesting, especially for the inner circle members listening to the show today of kind of how much goes behind the scenes to produce what we do inside of the inner circle that I think is going to be uh, really interesting. I want to say hello to just a few of our members who are joining us live right now. We got Allah here from Toronto. Thanks for being here. Andre is here. We got Sue Bradley here. We really appreciate you guys. Bob Templeton, uh, Francis from North Carolina, uh, our melodica player in the inner circle. Uh, Pascal is here. So great to have everybody live. I would love to start the show off here by taking a deep dive into the history of Learn Jazz Standards and like, how did this thing even become to be? So Justin, I'd love for you to uh, kick us off. And for those listening to the podcast right now, we are sharing some audio and in the show notes today, we're going to have the video of this podcast if you want to check it out later. But uh, Justin, why don't you go ahead and share your screen and uh, walk us through the beginning? Absolutely. So um, while I'm pulling up my screen, um, uh, we really started, um, with a very, uh, very simple blog idea. Right. And so I think, I think Brent, you should, you should highlight this. This is right when, um, if you've started to share my screen, it's, it's, uh, we decided we said we had a lime green website for a long time. Um, yes. Camden really started this and, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll let you give a little bit on the intro right here, but in 2010, when we sort of kicked off. Yeah, so this is this is the very beginning of Learn Jazz Standards. So in 2010, a friend of mine uh, named Camden created this. Web, he's a he was a, a, a elementary school um, or maybe also a high school jazz band teacher in the town where I grew up in uh, Boise, Idaho. And um, over his summer break, he was inspired by a friend of his who was making a full time living off of his blog. So he was inspired by that. And so he actually started this blog and it uh, really just featured like jazz standards, like, hey, here's a jazz standard. Here's a piece of sheet music. And later on, uh, we started creating 
backing tracks, which is goes to those famous, uh, really ugly. Like you can kind of see, you can see the logo if you like watch our YouTube videos where you see the really old logo with the green screen on the YouTube videos, which have some of millions of views. Uh, that's that's the original logo there. So around 2011, uh, Camden, you know, after he had been working on the blog for a while, said, "Hey, Brent, I I I don't have time for this. I'm a I'm a music teacher." So that's where I stepped in and I kind of started uh, working on the blog. So you can see here, this is, uh, we'll talk about this. This is 2013. It was kind of an update to the blog, but you can see like this is, this is what it was. Like this is the bare bones of what we had going on here. You can see right there at the top, uh, we started doing albums of the week. At the very beginning, it was just like, it, it wasn't, there was no strategy behind it. There was no nothing. It was just kind of Whoa. like, Here's and, some jazz standards and here's like some random blog posts. Yeah. And, and, and really the, the backing tracks that we did sort of, sort of sell uh, on the site really were such a small portion of the site. Really we made our money from like, uh, I think there was uh, two, two ads that we got like $400 a month for and uh, uh, random donations that we might, might see at this point. I mean, it was, and then there was some Google ads. Yeah. Um, so we're like, let's, we're going to monetize this by, uh, you know, there's only going to be Google ads on here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there are some Google ads. Um, but yeah, then on the screen now, it's uh, a, the, a picture, an iteration of the website. Um, we had, um, we had some, some, I forgot who was, who developed this website. Did Justin, this is where Justin kind yeah, of came I, in. I, the I came in and yeah, but um, it was a very rigid uh, site. This was the, that time when, you actually were looking at uh, one of your, uh, I think uh, a listener or oh, um, a subscriber to the, the email, you actually looked at his computer screen and realized, oh, this this website only works on like one screen size. Otherwise, <laughs> half, half the content is even viewable. So like that third, third column where it was like talking about the Great American Songbook was only viewable if you had like a huge retina display computer. Otherwise, um, you're on your phone. Good luck. Yeah. And just to give you an idea, and this is before Justin kind of came in and started, you know, you know, and I'll talk more about how powerful Justin you, you were at, at this phase. Uh, you know, this, like the, the business wasn't really making that much money at this point. I mean, again, I, I think it was like, I don't know even how long, probably an embarrassing amount of time went by since we moved to this new iteration of the website before I even realized that before we, I, I, I even realized like, well, people aren't even... <laughs> Like you can't even like properly use this. I mean, forget about mobile. What what was it even like on mobile, Justin? At this point, a lot of scrolling left and right, up and down. <laughs> it, it was um, yeah, it was a a free for all on that one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I do want to just uh, really talk about how you know a lot of our inner circle members or a lot of um those of you who've been listening to the podcast or are just following us in general probably don't fully understand how important Justin was for how we got to where we are today without Justin joining the team um especially when we were hardly making any money at all um to start taking control of our back end and our website and start going like hey here's like how we can make actual tech solutions work we 100% would not be where we are today. So just, I had, so I, had kind. I had, yeah, I just have to publicly, I do have to publicly thank you, Justin. Cause like, I mean, obviously we just wouldn't be uh, where we are today. Um, so moving on. Yeah. This was our first iteration of a website that would work on mobile. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. I, and I remember like we, we really specifically the, the last website was like custom made. And this one, we decided to go with a, a tried and tr like proven theme. Am I right about that? Yeah, this is the first time. Like, we're gonna go out and find like uh, an actual an actual theme that's already sort of pre created, and then start make little customizations. But not don't go too crazy on this one. But just the migration process from that old system. Like, we we already had a large. No, we already have all of the index um, already put together all those backing tracks, and so migrating the you know the 214 250 different backing tracks for every version to this site and all of the blog content poof yeah it i i cannot understate how much effort and work 
went into every single time we did a reiteration of the website, especially this one. I remember this one was like, um, you know, probably responsible for several years of my life lost. And I'm sure like even more of yours, Justin, <laughs> something I think would be interesting to point out about this. So this is in 2016 when we changed to this iteration of the website. And you can see if you're able, if you're watching the podcast right now, you can see that we have in the little blog post, you know, there's a collage up there uh, where you can see LJS podcast episode four. So 2016 is when we started the podcast and I never would have also started the podcast if it wasn't for Justin. So Justin, you at one point said, Hey Brent, like you should start doing a podcast. Why did you tell me to start doing a podcast? Yeah. I mean, this was the time I was doing a lot of commuting and uh, I was probably consuming 10 or 15 different podcasts uh, a day. And this was like, hey, this is where, you know, brands uh, really can express themselves. This is where communities can build around you, Brent. I remember when I first pitched the idea to you, Brent, you're like, I don't know if I'm willing to, you know, step out. Because I think that was a big, big step for you to sort of, you know, get in front of the 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 mic and start talking. I, I remember that first conversation, you were a little bit on these, like, I don't know if people want to hear like directly from me. Um, yeah, that's, that's, I, that's a really great point. I, I think before, before this time and, and to give a little bit more context, you know, in 2015 or really in 2016, I guess it's 2015. I like went full time on learn jazz standards. So before I was performing jazz musician and teaching and I, I did not stop doing that, but I would say I went full time as in I was finally able to pay my rent and my food bills from Learn Jazz Standards at that point, which was huge because it was just a lot of blood, sweat and tears. Right. Um, but that's so true. Like up until this point, I Learn Jazz Standards didn't really have a clear face to it at all. Like in the emails that we would send out every week, it would say my name in it. Right. But it wouldn't say. Um, it wouldn't really talk about like me. And so I think at this point, and that was a big nudge from you, Justin, is like starting to make, put a face to the brand, like who's actually doing this. Um, another like thing I'll point out too, is you can kind of see on the screen as well, if you're watching, there's these different blog posts that we were doing and it was mostly just the blog and we had only recently started the podcast. So you'll see there's some content like mastering musical doubt, um, the most important jazz albums of all time. And this is kind of when we started getting a little bit more focused with our content going, well, why are we just making a bunch of random content? Like are we should be making content that is specifically helping the people that are actually using learn jazz standards. And this kind of was like the beginning of that journey to trying to go, who is it that is actually checking out our blog? Who's on our mailing list? How do we help them more and how do we make the content that's going to help them actually improve, not just become some kind of jazz blog, right? So this was really the, the beginning of that, uh, that transition. Yep. I have memories of you telling me, you have to go check out this jazz humor article we just posted to the blog. I don't know what <laughs> year that was in. I have a memory of, I, I don't even know what we were doing. We were together doing something and you're like, man, we just, we got this amazing art it's a jazz humor story you have to go read this anyway but <laughs> that's that is a fantastic example like we were yeah. coming out with jazz humor articles <laughs> like stuff like <laughs> yep. i don't know like the top 10 jazz jokes like you know <laughs> stuff I, making fun of bass players like you know when the bass solo starts that's when you i don't know i forgot i don't even remember the jokes i think this is also when i decided that we were also going to get into instagram and it was my brilliant idea um to i, I know just, what you're gonna say i just took random i just like oh, i'm gonna google jazz musician quotes and i'm gonna put a picture and i'm gonna put a quote on it and then the way i was going to grow our audience was i was going to add as many people as possible as friends and then delete them and that's how i was going to grow our instagram audience so i read some random blog article how to hack instagram um, yeah I, and I don't think that actually really helped our, our, our strategy at all for as a business, but <laughs> no, it did, it did not. No, it didn't. But like that also, I think that's a good point you're making too. It's like at this point in the journey, you know, to grow learn jazz standards and what it is today, a ton of education about how to run a business and do online marketing, social media marketing, 
this is I, I do think this year, 2016, was the huge turning point because um, I know one of our members asked, um, sent an email before recording this podcast, um, like, has the business grown over the years? And it had like, we're lucky to say that, like, every year it has grown, like some years more exponentially than others. But 2016 was like a year of like, it was like a turning point year where like exponential growth after that. That was also the year that we decided that we were going to remove Google ads. I remember we had that conversation like, oh. Brent, are you willing to take a pay cut on this? And we're not going to, st we're going to stop using our website for ads because they're not really driving any, you know, benefit for our audience. It's really detracting from what we're providing here. That that's a great, great, great point. Um, that is so true. I mean, and that's kind of, Honestly, that was the mindset. What the website still wasn't making a ton of money though at this point. Um, yeah. It was again. I, I would say I went full time, quote unquote, at this point. But it was definitely a situation where, like, yeah, even just like a hundred dollars or two hundred dollars or three hundred dollars, us getting rid of. I don't remember how much the Google ads were making, but like us getting rid of them, that was like a stressful thing to me. I was like, I don't know, but we're like, Hey, this is not serving the audience that you don't need to be seeing a car commercial in our right hand column of our website, you know? So yeah, that was, that was a big deal. Yeah. So moving on. Yeah. This was, uh, yeah, this was, we actually started to actually decide like, this is when we like, I convinced you brand, like we need to put your picture on the front end of the website. <laughs> I was right. like, Brent, I want a picture of you on the site. Yeah. And and again, I do think you're right. That was like a, a struggle for me to be like, I'm going to put my face to this. Uh, so yeah, that was your prodding. Yeah. I mean, I, cause I mean, at the end of the day, I, I really feel like we're going to start, we're building a community here and people can't build a community around this random logo. Um, we need, we need your face on the front of this website. Um, I, of course, was going to keep my, I want to keep my face off the front of the website. I'm, I'm sure I'm buried in some about page that I was like, eh, this is a good spot for me. But uh, Brent, you can do all of the, the hard work and uh, we'll make you sit in front of the. Yeah, everyone. I can get all the uh, hate comments on YouTube and Justin will just sit back and watch it happen. Um, now, around this time, now, this, okay, before 2017, we, we were making products. Like the products we were selling before, again, like our YouTube channel accidentally kind of got popular back in 2010, 11, 12, 13 from just us putting up these uh, play alongs on YouTube, which were really just, it wasn't meant to be a big thing. It was just meant to be like, oh, that's part of one of the resources we're going to provide for free on our, on our website. Like we would just, we really just put them on YouTube so we could embed, embed them onto the pages on the website. That was the only thought behind it. But when we saw that, oh, hey, people really like using these playalongs, um, we started selling them as downloads, right? So we, we, did have, um, we did have products, right? But I think it was around 2016 going into 2017 where we, I had come out with an etude book, um, but we started coming out with... Uh, you know, actual products. And again, this was a big turning point in the business as far as like actually making money and figuring out what products does everybody want. So zero to improv was what I would call the first real product. And this is where I want to turn it over to Brett a little bit, because um, this is this is around the time where we had you start coming on. I was like, hey, we need someone to edit this music. Hey, we need someone to, you know, help put this together and create audio files. Brett, I want to talk to you about... <laughs> Let's talk, let's, let's, let's talk about the progression of where we were when we started working on products together to where we are now. Yeah. You know, it's crazy <clears throat> around the time you released your first etude book. I remember, do you remember there was that restaurant called Chihuahua it was like a really <laughs> kind of dark Mexican restaurant. <laughs> I, I, I totally remember. Yeah. It was very, remember, very dark, very dark. Yeah, there was just like, no one turned the light on. It makes you wonder if there was like whatever on the floor. But I remember crossing under the train to go to this place. I, I was talking about talking to you about, um, I, was I think I was actually talking to you about getting married. Was we were, And your phone kept ringing and ringing and ringing. And you're like, dude, I'm so sorry. And I guess it was because you had just released your etude book. Like, yeah. I, I don't know, right before we had met or whatever to 
to talk about it. But like, I remember being like, oh yeah, like it's happening now. Learn jazz standards is real. Yeah. Um, because like, I, and I don't know how much like viewers know, but like, you know, I was like you mentioned, just getting involved around the time of zero to improv, but I'd been in the peripheries because we were friends in college. Yeah. Like, I, you know, I was watching you do all of this work. I remember even like, I don't even know what we were doing, but I remember being like, Hey, do you want to go do this thing? And you're like, Oh no, man, album, album of the month is coming out. I got to go home and decide which album is going to get it. Like which, <laughs> which album should we pick anyway? But, but yeah, the, the learning curve for this, I think was insane because, you know, we went to jazz school, right? Like we were jazz musicians. Yeah. We knew a lot about jazz and, but then we're now trying to get this in an accessible format. And you know, in, in some ways, like the learning of the jazz worked for us, right? Because we knew the material. Mm -hmm. But the learning of the jazz, I mean, I guess I can speak for myself, worked against me coming on and learning, like creating resources for Zero to Improv. Like I know we have a lot of people who have taken that course. But when I was learning how to use notation software, it was in the context of arranging for big band. Mm -hmm. Like that's how I knew how to use this stuff. And so the was this the one where it was like everything was in C? So like, yes. Oh, that's a, that is something really important to point out. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the, this resource, which I, honestly zero to improv, like if you have, you're trying to find your way, like this is where you should start. But if you want to play with your friend who plays an E flat instrument and you play a C instrument, you guys are going to be playing, <laughs> you're going to be playing in harmony. Yeah. Um, so and, and, well so tell tell them about why that is so like okay. th so th this is the first like again the first like well first of all for context here yeah. on learn jazz standards we have all sorts of instruments we're not just for guitar players or piano players or bass players we're for all of you guys right so one of the big challenges that we face um especially when creating products um is we have to make versions for c instruments b flat e flat and bass clef it's a huge challenge. It's a massive challenge. And I, I like, as we go along, I'm sure you'll d dig deeper into that. But yeah, yeah, this was our first like real book. Where we were trying to actually do that. So, so we decided to just not do it. Because <laughs> we didn't know how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> so the solution was just to write everything in concert C. Yeah. And it, it works. It's fine. It works. But yep. that means that you can't do it. You can't do the book with anybody else because yep. it. And what we did is, wait, what did we, we, we transposed the play alongs, right? Or yeah. the, the backing, like the audio files, right? Yes, yeah. which the audio files transpose, well, no, I think we just, I don't, maybe we did transpose the audio files. I don't remember doing that, but I probably would have been the one to make those, right? No, yeah, you, you did. It, that we de definitely, <laughs> well, so that, that was, that was our solution because it was like, right. I don't, how do we make a version of a book oh. for everybody? Yeah. And like the only way we could think is this like, well, if you're a saxophone player, you, you have to use an audio file that sounds like what you're playing. You're right. right? So yep. if you're like trying to listen to a musical example, oh, we'll just transpose the audio file rather than actually transposing the music itself yep. and keeping all the audio files the same. Yep. Right? I remember trying to figure out how to automate that by <laughs> the, uh, for anybody who uses DAW software, everything you get from not the backing track recordings, but like the the musical examples is created in Ableton. And at the time, I was kind of trying to figure out how I could make these MIDI files automatically transpose. So I remember like counting out the bars and writing automation in to twist this transpose knob to get it to spit out what I wanted to spit out. And then, um, of course, I counted wrong. You know, yeah. so I just produced, you know, a number of incorrect files, um, which is it's all part of the journey. Right. But I guess the original point I was making in terms of like being educated in a particular way, in this case, working against us is like I was coming from this idea that like, you know, every line in your score is a different thing. But there's no music editing software that exists as far as I know that allows you to create four versions of the same thing easily. Right. So this was like the beginning of the journey where it's like, hey, we have this idea. How do we get it to sit in curse? How do we get it to sit correctly in all of these different transpositions? Um, which my original answer was no problem. I will just make a manual part 
for every instrument and every exercise. So, um, yeah, which is a lot of, lot it's of a work. lot. Well, I'm trying to think, well, so for zero to improv, we didn't do it, but I'm like thinking for a typical course. So like how many... the, the next book we came out with was the jazz standards playbook volume one. So was that right. 10 standards? That was the, t yeah, our 10, like our first 10 standard studies. Yeah. Right. So it would have been 10, 10 studies, right? Multiplied by four transpositions multiplied like, by however many exercises yeah which was at least you know so, uh, i don't know <laughs> yeah a lot um so i think i i kind of started to realize i mean not as fast as i would have liked but over a period of time that like doing things manually is not a good idea in in this particular case right because yeah. you wouldn't you wouldn't manually create even individual parts like if you were making a big band score like part of that process would be automated within the software. Um, I mean, you had to put the notes in, but yeah, definitely interesting, uh, a, a journey. It was a big journey to figure out how to do it quickly and also how to do it for people to get the most accurate results. I think we also started to have issues where like we were changing certain notes in etudes because it violated instrument ranges. Right. Yes. And we don't do that anymore for sure. Right. But Right. Yeah, that yeah, there's all sorts of challenges that came up with trying to make these four versions. Now, one thing too it was the organization of how we did this. It's like <laughs> to to create one of these products, like I mean, we have Google Drive folders, there's like tons of files. Let's talk about the Hell project. Let's talk about how to play with you here, our yeah. ear training course. Talk about I'm sure both Justin and and Brett can talk to this. Like, let's talk about this uh <laughs> this project. This was one of those where like um again i feel like every product until recently that we've come out with i've lost some years of my life this was certainly <laughs> one of them um so yeah t talk about this one you would say before every project brent i think this one will be easier than the last one <laughs> <laughs> I, that is so true and it was i think it was almost me trying to sell you on it like <laughs> Yeah, Brett, I'm, you know, last time was tough, but we learned so many lessons, right? So it's going to be easier. And for the record, that's how Brett always starts out new, new web ideas. Justin, I think this, this, this time it will be easier than the last time. We have everything. <laughs> so I, I, I feel you there, Brett. <laughs> oh, well, hey, it's, I'm just trying, I'm just trying to motivate the team. That's all, you know. <laughs> Well, this, Justin, we were talking about this a little bit earlier, but like for the how to how to play what you hear exercise, there's like, first of all, there's a lot of different intervals, right? And second of all, they go in a lot of different directions. So this was before I think we even understood how to like do this in a calculated way to make sure everything was where it belonged. But I remember... Well, I think Brent, part of it, we just didn't even talk, right? We, you, we yeah. weren't even in the conversation and then... I think you you finished something and then Brent said, okay, here's like 600 files. Um, how do we get them on the site? I'm like, what? <laughs> what am I supposed to do with 600 files? Yeah. And all named random somewhat things. Somewhat haphazard. <laughs> yeah. And that, that was a big problem with this project is like we just, there was no, the, the files were not named correctly. So at some point, well, not they were naming correctly. They were just never discussed what to be what to name them. So well, they were yeah. named so that I knew what they were. Yeah, but they like... weren't formatted in a way that made it so that anybody could read it, and that is so essential. Yes. Yeah, like, yes. I don't even know where to put these files. I. Yeah. <laughs> it was a uh, it was a fun one. Yeah. But it was the beginning for me, at least, of okay, like no, no accidents. Like everything is mapped out. This is how many things we're creating. This is where they go. These are the standard naming conventions. Um, I, I think it was the beginning of like having a clarity machine to kind of put all of these things through. Because um, even now when we start to do things, even if there are some parts of the process that we have to discuss, there's enough of a foundation of the way that things are labeled and how we communicate that most things fall under the idea of, well, this is how we used to do it. So it'll probably still work for this project. And typically I think it does. 
Brett, I think this is a good, so let's like kind of like fast forward a bit to like yeah. our product creation process. Let's, let's talk about, so for our member, for those who aren't members of the inner circle, um, every single month, one of the most popular things that we have in our membership, one of the funnest in my opinion is yeah. the jazz standards club, which is where we learn a new jazz standard every single month. Um, and it, it's just a lot of fun, but we have obviously a bunch of resources that we create for this jazz standard study. So in contrast to all this, like talk about walk through from literally the very beginning of the process of us creating a jazz standard study to the very end, like what exactly happens, like feel free to like get nerdy into the detail. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. So <clears throat> I have a list. Um, and for those of you who are into lists, um, I love this program called Rome Research, which whatever. But so this is where my list lives. We talk about Brent, everything gets a due date. And then there's a process. So uh, usually, like actually today, will the next standard study will be finished. So we're, you know, about the 15th of the month for the following for December. Yeah, for December. Um, so I, I the first thing I do is listen to a bunch of versions of the tune. Because with with the, you know, jazz standards, it's like there are a lot of things that are acceptable. But then it's sort of like we have to give the most correct version. Right. Um, you know, and, um, you know, people, players have opinions about what should be played, but we want to give the most correct, most common, most across the board standard uh, standard voicings. So that's number one. I just saw a comment come in asking what the don't, December Don't, don't is. answer. Uh, Allah, is, Allah is trying to jump the gun here. So we, it's... <laughs> Uh, from our from our one of our members, Allah is asking, "What is the December tune?" And Allah, I thought you knew things better, man. I thought you knew that we only announce that at the monthly Jazz Masterminds, but here you are trying to sneak it in. So no, we can't we can't reveal that. I think our monthly um, Jazz Mastermind is is it next week? I think it's next week, or no, maybe the week following. I can't remember. So, yeah. Anyways, can, so, feel free. So everything moves through four four phases. So. There's the listening phase, right? And then there's the resource creation phase. So in Finale, there are these things called libraries. Finale is a music notation software, right? So the nice thing about libraries in Finale is that it stores kind of your preferences and your ideas and your, you know, the things that are really specific to a piece that you're currently working on in this library. But now if you open a new file, it, it's all gone. Um, and you can import libraries, but you have to do it all manually. So basically, once I've listened and kind of got the changes out, um, I open last month's file, duplicate it, rename it, and delete everything. Um, so like for certain things, it doesn't matter so much. Like guide tones, it's all notes. So you change the key or whatever. But um, like, okay, here's something really interesting. So for the, uh, is it for the, for the chords analysis, right? Like, Think about this. So if you're familiar with it, like the top line usually has slashes and then you've got the chord above it. And then below it, you have some sort of definition of what's happening. So maybe you have some Roman numerals or you have like, you know, turn around to C or, or whatever it is that you have. Well, those things I would have to manually create every single time. So as a sort of way to fix that, what I've done is I've created uh, special uh, expressions inside of Finale. So I actually just create the C part and I will like write in like major one chord, which will then automatically place it on all four other finale files. So I'm able to sort of typeset it. It automatically pulls it into the other parts. The yep. four versions that we make C, B flat, E flat, and exactly. bass clef. Which yeah. are now all one finale file. So there's a score page, right? And that has all four parts on it. And then there's the individuals, which you guys, that's what the Learn Jazz Standards members get. They get their resource pack in whatever key right. um yeah so um so that way it kind of automatically gets set up correctly um and then i have another one that properly spaces it so like a major one chord is going to be the first line so i know it's supposed to be a certain amount below that bar right but then if i want to like comment on that and be like hey this is actually a delay of this next thing well when i click that I know that it needs to be spaced a certain amount underneath the first line. <laughs> so that's all automated so that I can kind of move through it pretty quickly. Um, and then those get exported. Uh, another one that's interesting is the scale map because, you know, you can't write C on a piece of music and then have finale transpose it. 
right? So like if I put text on a page that says C Ionian, well, when I go to the B flat part, that's no longer correct. Right. So for a while, be these... D Ionian, yeah, exactly. So for a while, I was like, oh crap, like I have to go through and manually check these. And I was producing so many errors. I actually remember I, I used to, part of my process used to be printing and manually with a red pen editing every single mistake. And there'd be hundreds. Yeah. Like it was anyway, but doing this, it, uh, what I've done is um, I've created two staves. So every part has two lines and the first line is where your notes go right and then below it it's the scale definition so that scale definition is actually custom chords so i created like the same way like you know you would have c7 above your music well like i created a custom chord so instead of saying c7 it says c mixolydian so right. i'm not entering in text i'm entering in chords and then when i move to the b flat part because finale recognizes that it's a C mixolydian chord, even though that's not a thing, right? That's what it's, that's what finale sees. Well, now when I bring it into the B flat part, it knows that it's D. Right. Yes. So, so, you know, like, just, and you spent just so much time and so many, a lot of trial and error coming yeah. up with like, so everything's perfect. Like when you're talking about the spacing about like, yeah. that's how exactly, like, it's like, you know, exactly like the spacing is always perfect now on all of our music. Like everything yep. is engraved. So it's perfect, basically. Well, and I think it it it, go, it talks a lot about how how I mean, every once in a while we still get, we still mess up, but just the number of tickets we get, no, number of people reaching out. Like I remember when we first came out with these, right? We probably got an email at least every time. It's like, oh, you missed you missed this yep. one little thing in this one little section. Um, but I mean, you've gotten it down to a science at this point, where you know we're we're trying to get all those errors out of there so that you know. It, well, it's as it's right every time. Contractor, there's nothing worse, right? So like, you know, whatever. Now we're like the Learn Jazz Standards team. But as a contractor, there's nothing worse than four weeks after you finish a project, getting the email that's like, hey, can you redo this? Like, it's the worst email to get. Um, yeah, it's my favorite thing to do too, you know, yeah, send those well, emails. Yeah, it's the worst email to send also. But, you know, it it should be it should be correct. Um, yeah. yeah. So once that's done, right. I print all of these parts and I put them into a, a Mac has like a, an, an automation thing. And maybe it's called automator, but I drop all of the files onto this button, which then produces one PDF file of every single chart. And then I go, uh, I go through to like edit it on the white screen because finale has like a, a yellow background and for whatever reason you can't see mistakes or at least i can't i can't proofread in finale it just doesn't work so yeah proofreading and then once it's done right i make those edits i export all of those files as midi files and import those midi files into an ableton template that has everything balanced out correctly um yeah and then those get exported then everything gets renamed and uploaded into google drive so it's yeah, it's it's a it's a process, but I'm listing all of these things off, which is making me realize how unbelievably complex it is. But because of like because of the like the complexity is caked in, so it's not like I have to go through the labor of thinking through this every single time. Like because it's caked in, it produces pretty good results as a part of the machine. You know? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah and there's other systems too that we have in place too. Like for example, one of our our in-house composer, Keelan Dimmick, yep. like he, he, he gets a notification of what tune he's making an etude from those get sent to you, uh, you and me, Brett, like, we'll like, we meet to like, you, you create the chords analysis. Then we get together and we like discuss yeah. or even debate. And yeah. sometimes we've talked about like, we should do like extra, like members only podcast episodes of just like us discussing what the chords analysis is because it yep. gets like super music and nerdy um uh, unbelievably yeah it's and it's fun um and then yeah like after you're done that process um i record a bumper you put you record the training video we mm -hmm. put the training video together and then that gets assigned to our va who goes and builds out the posts make sure the video is up on vimeo and the whole shebang and i feel like to come up with these systems. I mean, we're, I, I think we're continually like tweaking the systems and processes. This is just like one side of what we're mm -hmm. doing. 
Like this, mm -hmm. is, this is just for our members, right? And like, we're constantly tweaking the process to make it better and more functional. And man, I just, I feel like as a uh, organization, we've just come like so ridiculously far and yeah, it was, it's, it's, uh, it's cool, man. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's been a, a very fun and very wild ride. Um, <laughs> Speaking yeah. of wild ride, I want to kind of pivot our discussion a bit to let's talk about, I want to go back to you, Justin. Let's talk about some, you know, I don't like, I, we don't want to like dwell too much on like negative things. Cause obviously uh, over and above everything is like so positive about what we've done here. And it's just a blast, but what are some of our biggest tech fails that we have experienced? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I think, I think, um, there's that, uh, it was a couple of years ago when the whole, we, I think it was, we came out, it was like a couple of days after we came out with um, uh, the, the second course, the. Um, was it 30 steps to better jazz playing? Yeah, I think it was 30, 30 steps where um, the whole site went down um, and it was the absolute worst time for the site to go down. And uh, I remember you getting on the call with me, Justin, the site's down all the way. And um, I, I, I had no idea what to do. Um, there was, uh, we had to, we had to hire a contractor from Ukraine. Yeah. Oh, we, we were it, up for out. We were up all night for like two nights trying to get that thing. I think it was the longest time we had ever been down. I think it was like nine, nine or nine or 10 hours um, that we were down. And it was like, oh, this is a serious problem. Right. Cause I mean, you have to like understand like this is before our membership too, where launching uh, from a business perspective, Sue remembers, like, Sue remembers. like la launching <laughs> Sue remembers, uh, launching a course was, is huge. Like we, we spend like five, even sometimes six months working to make these courses. Like I'm recording videos, creating material. Justin's working on tech stuff. Brett's editing music, all this stuff. Like, you know, now it takes us much less to do this, these things, but like such a long time, like a ton of work to do this. And our business used to work solely before our membership off of like the success of us making our revenue numbers had to do with launches. So if our launches weren't successful and our, uh, you know, if, if folks weren't buying the courses, it was a big problem. So I, I remember when this happened and I was just like my blood pressure. So I, I remember specifically, like we had been trying to figure this out for a while and I was in Midtown Manhattan. I don't know what I was doing. I just have this memory. Of I was on the phone with you. Um, you know, the, the, the backdrop was just like cars are honking and it's just noisy Manhattan. So it's just like even more, you know, I'm just like, Justin, we just need to figure this out. <laughs> and you're like, man, I'm trying to figure this oh, out. Yeah. But yeah, that was. Yeah. Well, I th I think really what happened is we just didn't anticipate. You sent out a, a big email, and just too many people hit the site, and I couldn't get back control of the site. It's just <laughs> one of those. Like it, it was a great, it was a great, great thing to have a problem with. It's just like I don't know how to tell. Do I send an email and tell people to stop trying to hit the website for a little while? Or yeah, right. Yeah. And now, like, at, like uh, over over time, like usually from blunders we have all sorts of things that we have like vault press for backing up the site in case anything happens we can switch over quickly i mean you have a bunch of other things yeah. now in the background that are happening to like help us avoid you know catastrophe basically so yeah i want to hear you talk about justin talk about the time where we try to make the slow downer <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I remember you came to me this idea, like, well, we keep we keep recommending this uh, slow down rap. But I and what year was this? Well, this was like what? It would have been it would have been right around twenty, right after we launched the twenty sixteen site. Um, so late twenty sixteen, I think, um, if I remember right. Um, and we were like, oh, we're gonna we're gonna figure out our own slow down. And so we we went on to Upwork. And we're like, put out a job post. We're like, we're looking for an amazing engine sound engineer that can do all of these things. We hired a guy and it just sounded terrible. Yeah. So we were trying to make like the equivalent of like amazing slow downer or transcribe yeah. like to, you know, so people can like, you know, slow down the music. 
Um, or even like, actually, I think the main thing was like for our play alongs, right? Cause we, yes. we, we hired, we hired a designer to like design the player. The player looked amazing. It was like, so cool. We were like all amped up about it. But then as far as just either we didn't hire the right person or we couldn't hire the right person cause we didn't have enough money, which is probably the truth there. Yeah. And, and then third, it, like it just, it, yeah, like the, whatever he was coming up with just it just sounded so bad oh it's just the audio quality was so degraded it was just like sounded like we were trying to like jam it through like an old like 1920 radio and it's just it's like oh no one's gonna want to ever listen to this except for at normal 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 rate (laughs) right so in other words what's the point other than you just created an audio player so yeah that that was stressful because we were working with someone overseas. So first of all, it's like communication was difficult. Um, and I always spent like two months working on this and designing for it, planning for it. That was like the first, like really major fail. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, ultimately like, you know, we we, like, we paid the guy cause like we, he obviously we paid him. Like we paid, so we, we basically lost money to, for, for something just to never actually work. Um, but I, you know, it's like what everybody says, like you have to have some of those failures, like, um, which I feel like we've had lots of them, <laughs> like whether like people are aware of them or not, but they've always helped us like recalibrate and figure out like, what's the best way to go and to help serve our members, our customers and make our machine work better basically. So, you know, I can't help but notice, like, even as we're talking about this, like on a zoomed out level, <clears throat> Like, this is why, like, this is part of the reason why Learn Jazz Standards has continued to be something that is functional and, like, allows, you know, people to get this type of resources because there's, like, a group of people who were working on it together, right? Like, it's such, like, a microcosm of what happens in the inner circle where it's like there are going to be musical fails. There are going to be challenging things. There are going to be disappointing things. But like because you're having a go at it with other people that are on the same journey, it's a lot easier to course correct, recalibrate, not give up when it gets hard, find encouragement, encourage other people. Like, you know, we're, we're doing this one thing, like creating resource for people and, you know, kind of championing people's success. But it's sort of like, you know, what's happening here, like that is what's happening in the inner circle. You know, it's it's people holding each other up, people helping people go forward. It's like I, I, I'm listening to it and I'm like, that's what's happening in the inner circle. It's just happening with music instead of with trying to figure out the slow downer app. Yeah. You yeah. know, 100 yeah. percent. It's all yeah. tri- like, you know, whether it's running a business or playing music, it's yep. all trial and error. I, I, I feel like for me, the journey of like being a CEO of a business has been like, because it's kind of like we were talking at the beginning, Brett. It's like, you know, we learned we like you and me, man. We were trained to be musicians, right? Yep. Um, you know, I I didn't know any. I didn't know anything about marketing. I didn't know. I remember the first time I realized we had a mailing list. We just like on the original website or whatever. We had a little thing at the very top that had like, join our newsletter, right? Like nothing even enticing about it. Just join our newsletter. And then one month, I logged into our our uh, ESP, like after never ever looking at it, and there was 800 people in there, and I was like, "Oh, maybe I should send an email to them to tell them about the new blog post <laughs> that came out." Like, you know, you know, it's like I didn't, I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything about content marketing. I didn't know anything about anything, right? And then I didn't know anything about. I, I would feel I say in the next last couple years, and certainly still on the learning curve about how to like hire people and build a team and make an organization work better. And it's just like, you know, that, and all of that is like so directly related to the success that we can have for our, for the members. Right. It's like, there's like clear times where the fact that I just didn't know what I was doing led to us not serving the members. Right. And there's the clear times where it's like the fact that I did know what I was doing Mm -hmm. led to some like, really mm-hmm. great successes for for people so it's like it's all what i've what i've been learning especially in the last couple of years is it's all it's all interrelated like mm-hmm. all the behind the scenes stuff we're talking about right now it's like all this stuff like in the constant refinement of what we're doing is leading to like a better 
result for our members or even for those who aren't members who are just like like listening to the podcast who like watching the youtube channel um and like are getting served that way right so it's just it's all part of the uh all part of the puzzle so yeah yeah here's a question from david i think it's a great question david fowler who's uh live on our chat right now uh question one of the great things about the monthly jazz standards club is the forum for posting feedback is there any plan to put the form in an app format to facilitate reading and commenting? Justin? <laughs> yeah, so Brent actually and I have gone back and forth quite a bit on this. I, I think, yes, there that's definitely our goal. We wanna, not only just the forum, but I mean, really most aspects of the site. Um, one of those things that, you know, I, I don't, I, I, I have uh, web development skills, but app skills are not my, uh, my forte. So that's one of the things we have to sort of uh, be very careful about. Um, but uh, I, I definitely think that's, that's more near term than long term for where we're trying to take um, the LGS yeah. community for sure. Yeah. So like and anyone who's in the inner circle or, or just so those who aren't in the inner circle listening, like to get an idea, like something that we think that we find is so important. And we really, really like all of our courses are call to actions. Like, you know, don't just learn a new music theory idea. <laughs> like you actually have to do it. And so, you know, in the inner circle, there's all kinds of people that are posting recordings in themselves and videos. And we, we find that the people that are doing that consistently are really the ones, well, not only the ones that we can measure their progress, but they're mm -hmm. clearly the ones that are holding their own feet to the fire and getting things done. So the question is how to facilitate that better. And that's definitely a conversation. I think Brett, you and me were even just talking about that yeah. the yeah. other week about mm -hmm. how, like, if, if there was, if we could have an app where it would just be so much easier to like, to use it. And I, I think it would increase engagement among members, get people yep. more involved. Um, yeah, we're still, I think it's very, so David, to answer your question, like more fully, I think we're very much still like trying to iron it out. Like there, there, we actually do, there is a solution for us to create an app through the plugin that we use to run the forum on the inner circle. Yeah. So there's actually a, a solution there. Um, we're just trying to, we're still in the very early stages of thinking about it, I think, but um, you know, we're always well, and, like, and the solution just launched too. So we, well, I've been watching it very closely and, and the bugs when I'm always really nervous, especially with the community at this point, we we've learned quite, quite, uh, unfortunately frequently that yes. starting with something that's, uh, the first time is uh, not usually, it's not always the best time to raise your hand and be the first people to try out a new solution. <laughs> Exactly. Because, you know, if, if like they're like the, if the program that they're using is buggy, right, we're using a third party like uh, app basically is buggy. Um, you know, it, then it becomes a huge problem because it's like, okay, now our members are getting frustrated at us because it's not working. And then we only have a limited control over that because we're having to work with a third party to correct a bug that's happening so that's and like 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 you said justin like we like really try to be careful these days about what we implement on the website to make sure that it's going to be have like there's always going to be issues like always going to be like there's no way to avoid it like there's always going to be mistakes always gonna be human error but to try to eliminate the possibility as much as possible that things could go wrong so i feel like we're being with tech wise i feel like we're being a little bit more cautious these days before we're we trying kind of we're trying Yes, exactly. And David, um, we'll definitely we'll definitely look for you if uh, uh, when when we're when we're ready to r roll out a pilot. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, looking for some questions that were asked ahead of time. This is one that Sue asked via email, and Sue uh, said, "I'd love to know whether you started Learn Jazz Standards with a global audience in mind, whether you've developed on the ground communication with jazz education in other countries." and whether the pandemic increased the number of people from all over the world basing their jazz learning on LJS guidance. Um, interesting question, Sue. So uh, the first part of your question was, um, did we create Learn Jazz Standards with a global audience in mind? I don't think so. <laughs> I, I don't think we, so I don't think we, we started it with like a mindset of like, 
you know, we're, we're all based here in the US, but we I don't think we ever thought to ourselves, we're creating something for Americans, right? <laughs> but I, I think what I think it just speaks to what jazz is like jazz is it's African American music. But I think the amazing beauty of it is that it is become such a uh, it's an international music too right now. It's just like everybody from around the world loves it. So, I mean, you know, Sue, I think Sue, you're from the UK. Like, so if you, if, if you, if you've ever been a part of our inner circle membership, like you'll look and you'll see like people from Europe, from South America, from all over the place, you know, I just everywhere, Canada, you know, the United States, Australia. it's very yep. international. Right. Um, but I won't, I don't think that, I think it just kind of naturally became that because it's the internet, right? And then yeah. people well, are still surprised every, one, every once in a while, we also get questions to uh, translate our materials into different languages too. And that's the whole whole other ball game, translating the musical notation. And then like, uh, I don't know if we're quite ready to translate into different languages. Yeah. Woo! If you use Google Translate plugin. Yeah. And I, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's like, well, that would be a great idea, but the resources to actually accomplish that would be... Um, yeah quite insane we also do get that that question a lot about tabs like doing guitar tabs i would i would love to get guitar tabs for all of our, all of our material but i mean that's like a fifth you know that maybe something maybe in the future we'll figure that out you know but that's like a fifth version of all of our material we have to make it's also so much of an opinion like tab tab tablature notation has such an opinion to it right it's like hey this yes. is what we're telling you we're telling you that you should play this note here, but like then another guitar player is like, no, you should actually do it here. And then you yeah. find out their hands are two different sizes. And yeah. now, I and know. I get, and I, yeah. And I get why guitar players want to like, cause guitar players are notoriously not good music readers, mm -hmm. <laughs> even though we do like encourage as much as possible in the inner circle to learn music by ear, like at least dip your feet into it. Right. But it's, um, yeah, it's like I get it because like it's like, well, that that's just that's the way they learn how to read music is through tablature. But then it is like very subjective how you navigate your instrument. Right. And so mm -hmm. um, like, you know, yeah, totally. That's it's anyways, it's a it's a thing. <laughs> yeah. um, what was the other part of her question? So has the pandemic increased the number of people from all of the world basing their guidance what would you say justin do you think that's the case that has the pandemic mm. brought in i mean we yes and no i mean i think there's some like some people that have dipped their toe back into like they had some more 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 time but i think at the same time we've also lost people uh, as well I, I don't know traffic traffic increased maybe marginally but yeah, I, I agree. It's hard to tell. Well, so one thing that, and this will be interesting to talk about really quickly is like in 2020, we transitioned the business model to membership. Like we still do sell some of our courses in the eBooks um, a la carte, but we really just, we went over to the membership model. So that's when the pandemic hit actually. And so yeah. because of that, it's, you know, like, like we talked about earlier, like the business has grown. We've been fortunate that the business does grow every year, but as far as like, is it there more or not that that's hard to tell simply from, um, because we switched to that model at that point. So there's also I, so many other factors. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, definitely. <laughs> That'd be interesting to talk about. So what, like, why did, so I think someone asked that too, like, why did we switch to a, a membership model? So I, I think I was mentioning before that before, like, for example, Justin, when we were talking about when the website went down, we were launching 30 steps to better jazz playing. That was, it's so stressful because when you have a business that runs off of launching individual courses and, and eBooks, like there's a couple things that happen there. So one um, there's an immense amount of work that has to go into that leading up to that moment. Okay. Um, two, if your product isn't what everybody wants, or it's not a hit, then you're not going to make the revenue numbers that you need to make. So there's so there, there is so much pressure on constantly coming out with the new hottest, amazing course. And I think that for me personally was like, that's not really serving our audience that well if i 
you know, in a way we need more of a comprehensive learning environment that is more mm -hmm. based around like, yeah, community. So on, on, I think there's two sides of it. So one is on the business side, like I'm describing, like now we, we make decisions based off of, we, we know what our, what our, what our generally what our churn rate is typically every so churn rate means for those who are listening the people that you know god forbid who would ever do this leave the membership um but and we also kind of know in general from our current marketing efforts how many people will join so we kind of understand like how much money we're making generally every single month and that allows us to make decisions about oh can we invest in an app for our members oh can yeah. we um, get some more instrument specific courses for our members. Can we, in, like, can we add someone else to the team to fill, to fill in a, a gap that's not happening right now? Like the, so on one hand, it's a business decision. On the other hand, like I said, like really every decision we make is how do we help musicians learn how to play jazz better and how do we make it easier for them? And I think what we were doing before is great coming off with these one off courses, but what we do in the inner circle, as soon as we launched the inner circle, I knew it was 100, it was 300% the right move. Um, I don't know, Brett, talk a little bit about the inner circle. Like, tell, how, what's the vibe in there? Like, how, yeah. how do you think that like changed things? Well, the vibe is crazy good. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I don't know. Okay. So, specifically, right? Like, you know, I think sometimes jazz is, it can be like a little bit, sometimes there's an element of like musical superiority right like there's none of that in the inner circle I, or i say that like the, the the community within the inner circle is so welcoming encouraging friendly also very active like to, you know just for some context right like i'm in there a lot of days and i would say in order for me to not miss any posts or not miss what people are saying i'm going back at least six pages to make sure that i don't like people are always sharing um and the other thing i think that's unique about the membership and and also unique about the like uh that's what we're trying to teach is that like jazz is communal music yeah like you know you can certainly play solo jazz but it like it, from its conception it, it's always been played by many people it's not the same as like hey here's this solo instrument piece so, so there's certainly some of that but it it is so much built off of everybody having an important role to play everybody playing with each other like people musically suggesting things to each other you know via playing and i think we're able to see a, a microcosm of that because it's a membership where you're seeing the same people like um andre who's here has like you know uh, started posting stuff from a year ago, just being like, Hey, check out how much I've improved. Well, because it's a membership, some of the people who are commenting on his posts from a year ago also commented on that previous post and they've seen the progress. They, some of them have even made suggestions to help him improve. Um, so it's like, you get this feeling like everybody is working together, no matter where you are on the journey. And we have all different levels. So to create that environment and one other thing on this is like anybody can provide information, right? Like in order to learn, you need to have access to the information or some experiential access. But what I think what we try and do is create a pathway for people to become jazz musicians, not necessarily professional jazz musicians, but people who look at themselves and say, I'm a jazz musician. What do you play? I play jazz who identify with it. And part of their ability to do that actually depends on feeling connected to other people who feel the same way about themselves. That's the thing that really drives learning. Because if you believe that you are a musician, you believe that you're becoming a jazz musician, then all of a sudden that knowledge grows exponentially because you're connected to others. You even view yourself that way. It becomes important. Your life gets sort of structured around this. So I think those are sort of the intangibles of the membership that makes it so awesome and so unique. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. It just, as soon as we launched it, like I was like, Oh, we had these tiny communities and all these one-off individual courses. It was very disjointed. As soon as we did the membership, I was like, Oh, these are our people. Like these are, this is the tribe. And, yep. 
you know, I know a lot of our inner circle members have said like, man, I actually have friends now <laughs> that are, you know, right. this is online. And, you know, uh, you know, I, I would even say for myself, like I, I never really consider myself like an online community person, um, except for until we launched the inner circle. And now I'm like, oh yeah, no, this is like a tribe of people that are all like geeks about playing jazz and learning <laughs> music and practicing. And there's something so powerful about that. Francis actually asked a really uh, interesting question. Um, I think you do a great job of it, but I, I wonder what is it like trying to teach a lot of students with a huge range of abilities that you never actually meet? Um, the first answer to that question I would say is, as when we launched the inner circle, it immediately improved that from like, yeah. oh, one-off communities and courses to like, oh, everybody's here. And what do you, but what's your thoughts on that, uh, Brett? I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts oh. are. Well, I think with a huge range of abilities that you never meet. Okay, regular posters, like people that are constantly showing up, posting recordings, like maybe I've never talked to you, but I know you're playing. I know your strengths. I know your weaknesses. I remember what you're doing. I remember why you decided to do it. And so like, yeah, I've never met them, but, you know, I know they're playing. Like I know a lot of times we're even able to glean from what other people are posting, like what's important to them or what's, you know, what their goals are. Right. So, um, so part of it is like, yeah, we actually do. I think through the peripheries, if you're constantly reading other people's posts, you actually do know. Right. And then I think in terms of meeting the wide range of abilities, like it's the same thing. We have insane amounts of data coming in of people asking particular types of questions with people having particular types of struggles. And then when we're producing new content, um, it's not a mistake because we're like, oh, you know, 15 people have had a really hard time because they don't know how to properly navigate their instruments. Enter, you know, the uh, instrument accelerator courses. Um, so I think it's, first of all, it's a ton of fun teaching. And second of all, like having it set up in the membership, it kind of feels like I do know these people, you know, yeah, there's, there's sure. some semblance of like, Oh yeah, I know you. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't know if that answered the question, but yeah, that, I, yeah, I, I think that answers the question. And yeah. well, I, I certainly don't want to like say, I don't want to say too much, but like, there's definitely, you know, someone asked, sent an email earlier before this episode, um, what are some of the plans for 2022? You know, again, like very early stages, don't want to say too much, but there are a few uh, things cooking on the back burner where there will be some possible, I think there's going to be an inner circle, some more actual, actual one-on-one -on -one stuff or not one-on-one -on -one per se, but like stuff where we're actually interacting even closer than just on a forum, but I'm not going to say, I'm not going to get into anything. I don't want to give, I don't want to say too much. I don't want to say too much. I'm one of I, I just, I probably shouldn't have said anything anyways. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can't help myself sometimes. Um, it's one of these projects that Brent's going to come to me after this and say, Brent, Justin, it's going to be easier than last time. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, that that is probably exactly what I'm going to lead with to start with. I'm just going to say I have this. We have this new uh, uh, initiative, and uh, it's going to be so easy. It's going to be super easy. I think we had a conversation the other. So we're having our we're doing Learn Jazz Live 2022. That was our virtual summit that we did. We did that this year at the beginning of the year. That was wow. That was harder than I thought it was going to be. Um, <laughs> I think for Justin, that was way harder than, than we thought it was going to be. Yeah. So when I told Justin a, a couple of weeks ago that we were going to do Learn Jazz Live 2022 um, in a slightly different capacity, I was like, yeah, but you know, it's going to be easy because you know we already built all the stuff. And <laughs> what did you say to me, Justin? Uh, yeah, I said, yeah, all of that is sort of gone now. Uh, so, I mean, it's all been decommissioned. It's going to all have to be mostly redone. Uh, it's a lot of manual work, but it was yeah. a lot of fun. The, the LGS Live was a lot of fun, and I, we got a lot of great comments from everyone, and I think it's going to be worth it. So um, I'm I'm excited for the yeah, yeah, yeah. Even, even though uh, it's not it's going to be as easy as Brent thinks it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, this is like a typical like entrepreneurial like the entrepreneur comes to like the like everybody who's like responsible for like making things happen and it's like hey i got this great idea and it's gonna be so easy and you know 
ideas and and justin has had to put up with me for so many years especially like where i'm like hey justin yeah i want this to happen and you're like yeah okay and <laughs> you know what i mean it's like you've definitely had to put up with me a lot over the years just like coming up with these you know grand ideas and like how like implement it how do we actually technically get those to actually happen you know <laughs> so um <laughs> Are you in the back of your head, Justin? This is like totally a nerdy question, but are you in the back of your head thinking, how do I have to not manually redo it in 2023? Like, is that happening? Yeah, right? yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> it's like, uh, this is now this is now going to be an ongoing thing, I think. So I'll have to figure out how to... Okay, yeah. That. Yeah, so <laughs> if, like if I was in that, that position, it would be the same thing. I'm like, I'm never redoing this again. Like, <laughs> like how do I make it so that it just does it? Yeah. 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 yeah, I feel like Brett, you're like the, you've become like the master of that, like the of <laughs> systems and processes, and like you have you know things so like straight and clear. I mean, I'm like I've like been influenced by you, Brett. Like getting like, for example, we just I just hired uh, we just hired a new um, assistant, and like everything that um, she has to do is like there is a SOP document for everything. And there's like a weekly schedule for every, like there's basically like, here's like a handbook for how to do everything. Like here's a tutorial video for how to do like everything. And like yeah. that way it's just like not continually doing random manual work and re trying to reinvent the wheel every single time. So it's a structure creates freedom and creativity. Yeah. Like the more structure, the more and sometimes even cases even the more rigid your structure is, the more freedom, creativity outside of the box thinking you're going to end up having. And that's that I mean that's my take on things, but yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um well guys, this has been a fun episode 300. I feel like I, I feel like uh Well, let me how about you guys give some parting words or some like closing thoughts and then I'll give my closing thoughts. So you want to go Brett, first, oh, Justin? Wait, yeah, no. yeah, Justin. <laughs> Brett's like, I haven't thought about my closing thoughts. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll go. I mean, I think my my, my parting thoughts is uh, uh, this has been an amazing journey. I think one thing that I, I really love, and I, I think Andre and several of the other key inner, inner circle members have been doing a good job. Don't, um, well, I can't, we can't always promise we're going to change everything. When you guys uh, send in emails of like, hey, you know, I appreciate what you guys are doing here are some like key things. Like those are super eye opening for us. So I mean, like even in here, um, just in some of the comments today, I think there's been some really good things as well. But when, when we read those, those are like, well, I mean, obviously we can't do everything. It, it really helps to start to get a clearer picture of like, these are some of the holes in the community, or these are some of the holes in the website. And uh, that, that, I mean, that helps us a lot. It helps me instead of just like, I know when Brett and I are like, Hey, what if what if we what if what if we did this? And it's like, well, I don't know if people like it. I guess we could try it, and then, and then of course, and then someone's gonna email in and say that's a terrible idea. But uh, ho <laughs> hopefully, it, it works. Um, but um, we'll look, continue to continue to send in your ideas, um, and uh, yeah, and we'll try to keep iterating on on the site. Yeah. Uh, I'm like closing thoughts. I have this opportunity to say something to inner circle members. Well, I guess I'll say this. Well, and 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 podcast listeners and, and, and podcast. podcast listeners. You know, wherever you are on your jazz journey, like whatever you're doing, um, you know, continue to have fun. I know it's such a like cheesy encouragement, but I guess I'm like, yeah, with this like one moment of fame, my closing thoughts. Like, don't let the work stop you from enjoying what you're doing like be committed to foolishly having unbelievable amounts of fun because i think it's the number one thing that will guarantee that you continue to progress um so those are my closing thoughts i know that's not necessarily what we talked about but i'm like that is number one most important thing about jazz inner circle mm -hmm. or not member whatever like don't let the work choke out the joy and the fun yeah, I, yeah. I, that has to be the number one. Like, if you're not having fun uh, playing music, um, you know, then it's going to be a problem. And I think yeah. everybody has like their own personal responsibility for that because yeah. it's, you know. But uh, man, my closing thoughts. I mean, wow. I, I, it's hard for me uh, to not get a little emotional thinking about episode 300 because, like, 
I feel like this journey from the beginning of learning jazz standards to now has been one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life, but it's also been one of the um, most, it is by far the most, one of the most rewarding things I've ever done in my life. Um, and it has been, uh, you know, what, just the whole process of working on these episodes, built, making YouTube uh, videos for you guys, serving our members. It's, it's literally been one of the most inspiring things ever. And, you know, there's been times throughout the years where I thought to myself, you know, is this even making an impact? And one thing I have to think is our inner circle members, like all the people in the chat right now, all the people who are going to listen to this after when this podcast comes out uh, on Monday is like, I wouldn't be here if it, none of us would be here if it wasn't for you guys. Um, you know, so thank you. And thank you for being so fired up about jazz because there's been times where you guys made me excited. Like I listened to your recordings and I was like, man, that is so cool. I'm inspired by, by the way that you guys did that. And for those who have listened to the podcast, I, I still sometimes get emails from people saying, I just listened to episode one of the podcast. And I'm like, first of all, a little embarrassed because <laughs> that episode, you know, when I listen back to the episode, I'm like, oh man, that was a little weird. My voice, I was like lowering my voice a little bit. I don't know why I did that. But, you know, <laughs> there's some people that have literally, like, I've had people tell me like they binged every episode of the podcast in like three months. Everybody who's like been listening to the podcast, whether like you started listening last week, where you listened like from the very beginning or any, I, I just appreciate you. Like seriously, like, that, it's what keeps me going. It's what keeps me excited to create more content and continually trying to help serve you guys better. I know Justin and Brett feel the same way. So from the bottom of our hearts, thank you. Thank you for uh, being with us to episode 300. Uh, appreciate you guys. And we'll be seeing you guys for many, many, many more episodes and content in the future. Cheers. Cheers.